I would like to thank King Solomon for his extraordinary words and the magnificent kingdom of Saudi Arabia for hosting today's summit. I am honored to be received by such gracious hosts. I have always heard about the splendor of your country and the kindness of your citizens. But words do not do justice to the grandeur of this remarkable place and the incredible hospitality you have shown us from the moment we arrived. You also hosted me in the treasured home of King Abdul Aziz. Friday news dump. <laughs> this is just stuff from the New York Times here. President Trump told Russian officials in the Oval Office this month that firing the FBI director, James B. Comey, had, quote, relieved great pressure on him, according to a document summarizing the meeting. I just fired the head of the FBI. He was crazy. A real nut job, Mr. Trump said, according to the document, which was read to the New York Times by an American official. I faced great pressure because of Russia. That's taken off. Mr. Trump added... I'm not under investigation. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, you guys are really falling for a classic deep state soft coup, which is obviously what's happening here. Mm -hmm. These leaks are coming because Trump is draining the swamp yeah, in D.C. and they're threatened by it. Read yep, between they're the pushing lines. back. Yeah. It's, a, it's a soft brain coup. <laughs> so the soft spot on the top of Trump's head never This will be known as the Fontanelle coup. <laughs> <laughs> so we were joking earlier about... Uh, Lavrov, I mean, what must have been going through his head sitting there being told this shit by Trump? Like, I just like the idea that he will just try to just be like, wow, I'm going to push this as far as it goes and then just be like, Mr. Trump, my, my niece, she's a great fan of you, America, huge fan. Could you please hold up intelligence documents for her? <laughs> you give big thumbs up. I take picture for her. She loves USA, love Trump very much. She tell me she already tired of winning. <laughs> <laughs> Sergey Lavrov, who came up in the most, one of the most vicious, backbiting, conniving, insane political scenes to come up in, in 90s Russia and comes to one of the top posts in the government. And he just, he had to plot and scheme his entire life to get there. And the guy he now sees at the other side of the table is just this doddering toddler <laughs> of a man. <laughs> He's like, it can't possibly be this easy. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, part of him had to have been like, shut the fuck up. Dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, are, it, you, you are no use to us if you are like bolt action, you know, captive bolt gun to the head in a week because you can't <laughs> shut the fuck up. Well, we were joking about this earlier that like the, the, gr the greatest Trump the defense Trump has is that there's no way the Russians, if they indeed were colluding with him to like swing the election to him, could have ever, if he could have possibly known about it. No. Because had they told him about it, he would have told everyone else. Of course. He Easily. would have said it on the campaign and be like, folks, Russia, they like me so much, they're literally willing to intervene <laughs> and break the laws of our nation on my behalf. It's great. Can you believe we're it? We're going to have such good relationships with Russia. Yeah. They're breaking into the DNC right as I speak? <laughs> and he probably like, would have reeled back request. on his cabinet criticizing Putin. Yeah. He would have prevented Tillerson from, you know, making that giant yeah. boner. He wouldn't have hit the SAA as he did today. It's just that he's like an incoherent dumbass. And I'd say about 60% of the people he hired are lying weirdos who probably did collude. And because they're people like Flynn who can't keep his story straight, that's coming out. And then the other 40% are just neocons because he didn't have, imagine he would have to hire that many people. It's really risible watching all these libs conflate Russia and communism because they have idiot brains and they can't hold two thoughts at the same time. As we saw in the awful Time magazine cover that turns the White House into the Kremlin that is actually St. Basil's Cathedral. <laughs> so good. Trump, You're a bunch of dumbasses. Well, didn't asses. they also do the thing where they like tried to cover like the women's march or something and they instead of using the female symbol they used the male yeah. symbol? I, I believe <laughs> it. That was, <laughs> that was my so, 
the one month when I was the time cop. I was, I was like, this is for all the male feminists. Few, few people know this, but actually, uh, the editor in chief of Time Magazine is the cake boss. Yeah. <laughs> and he was just going, whoa, I've never seen a, no building like this. It looks like Candyland. Yeah. But I'm at it, honestly, at this point, maybe they're onto something in that maybe there is like a, a, a crypto communist deep state in Russia that never lost power, that is still there, and that did collude to make Trump president to destroy America. It worked. Because no matter how this ends, with him like having a stroke on the toilet, uh, resigning but not mad about it, or maybe even getting impeached, I mean, at this point it's hard to believe he's going to leave office in the natural term, uh, there's the damage is done. How, how do you look at a country that could allow this man who is genuinely the stupidest person maybe to ever achieve high, Amer- high influence in America? I to think that's do what he very did. fair to say. Yeah. Like how, I mean, how do you have any faith in institutions that allow that to happen? I, how can you ever be like, well, we'll fix it at the ballot box? Really? Well, my idea for the uh, Republican Party, and it's such a good one, I'm hesitant to say it lest they find out about it is that they find some way to have him technically resign his power as commander-in-chief and and president, but can stick around in a sort of a semi-ceremonial position as America's special guy. (laughs) (laughs) And he gets to, like, dedicate aircraft carriers, fly around in a helicopter, still wear the bomber jacket. Oh, yeah, he is our special little guy. Like, meet the World Series winning team and just be like... Treat him like a dying child. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it's like a make a wish. wish. Yeah, (laughs) I I think... That's the problem, is that we have... Uh, unique in Western democracies, our head of state and head of government is the same person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Everywhere else, basically everywhere else, they don't have that. They either have a parliamentary system with a elected ceremonial president or they're a constitutional monarchy. We alone have this system where the guy in charge of the f- actual functions of government is also the symbol of America. And uh, it's it creates a very weird schizophrenic relationship. But when... Uh, w- when we have our next president and it's going to be, you know, after Pence, if Trump doesn't serve out his term, then we get like, you know, Marco Rubio or fucking Kristen Gillibrand or something. People are going to say like honor his return to the office, but you can't get the ketchup off the resolute nope. desk. <laughs> it's like, you can't, yeah. You, you can't can- get like the sketches <laughs> of boobs out of the situation. Room. This is like the, the lectures they give kids to like scare them off sex where they're like, OK, see this tube of toothpaste? Squeeze out all the toothpaste. Now put it back in. You can't, can you? Yeah. <laughs> Once no. you squeeze the toothpaste, it's yeah. gone. That is why I am, I've said it before, and I will say it again. And I'm going to keep saying it because I'm not kidding. We should abolish the presidency. Yeah, why after not? This. Yeah. If fucking yeah. can be president. It yeah, I don't think any like reasonable person who has any reasonable kind of support for democracy in the abstract sense would disagree with that. Yeah, I mean, like this. Yeah. This is an institution that, even before Trump, had just become this runaway. Uh, Pseudo, its own state within a state with its own national security policy the, through the through the National Security Council, able to exercise power totally outside of, of of intervention of the voters. And now, in addition to that, it can be captured and that power wielded by a a man child, a, a freaking William Faulkner character. <laughs> the, and so, I mean, if the danger of that institution existing, if the presidency at, at this point cannot be shown to be the fucking just loaded gun sitting in the nursery room that it is, I don't know what else you can, you can what other conclusion to draw. Burn the White House down like the British in, in the 1812 war now. Like, when he leaves, just turn it into, uh, uh, you know, like maybe a government... Uh, Childcare facility or a museum <laughs> or a fucking McDonald's in honor of Donald's favorite food. Uh, but do not put another asshole in there and give him that yep. kind of power. The the executive branch, it grows like an organism and it has since 1968. I mean, really, if you look at things going from 1968, nothing in the sense has ever gotten better. Since Johnson, since Nixon, it's expanded its power to act unilaterally on national security matters, as Matt alluded to. And what you end up getting is, well, people think that the deep state is like this, you know, brilliant plotting thing that can orchestrate any event and artificially make anything happen. And really, its only power is to grow itself and to allow itself to keep infecting the body, to keep being the head of this parasite. The result of it is, you know, 
that it's so big and unwieldy that it's fighting itself. In Syria, the YPG is fighting, you know, the Pentagon's backed for uh back Syrian rebels are fighting the CIA's moderate rebels. It's so contradictory and so big and can it should the idea of like a comprehensive new world order type deep state we should have lost that idea when Trump won. It can't do anything except continue itself. It was supposed to keep a guy like this out, but all it can do is just amble through the world like a headless chicken. And now that we're seeing these leaks, and I mean, I honestly don't know. These people are, they probably are people he fucking appointed, you know? Like, this isn't even, like, the bureaucratic structures of government, because we know he only trusts a few people. He only keeps a few people around. So these are people who don't have that sort of uh, deep state investment in getting rid of him. They just don't want to go to fucking jail. And they, they, they see what's going on around them, and they're like, I, I, there's, I have zero sense that this asshole has my back, obviously, because he trusts no one and he has no, <laughs> no. He has no loyalty to anyone else. He would sell me out in a heartbeat. <laughs> Matt, you mentioned uh, people afraid of going to jail. Uh, I was just thinking about, just fantasizing about, salivating about, if you will, Trump skating indictment by snitching on Jared oh, and sending him he'll to do prison. It. Yeah. So good. Think about Jared going to prison. Think about 2017. Maybe it's not so bad after all. Maybe this is the year where everything bad starts to become good. Jared Kushner goes into jail. Jared Fogle comes out. Hell yeah. <laughs> Imagine Jared. Or maybe they could just be cellmates and it could be like a buddy comedy. The, the Jared would be like Jared Fogle because he's noble, would want to stay in there and help. But his Jared's angels, his gang would be like, it would be like Goodwill Hunting. They're like, I, my favorite thing is coming to the rec room because I hope that one day I won't see you there because you're out there, you're leading Center for American Progress, <laughs> replacing Nira Tandon. And that's what Jared does. But then Jared Kushner goes in and they're like, Hey, we're Fogel's angels, bitch. Ivanka has fled to Saudi Arabia and married a minor prince who's also a Twitch streamer. She's moved on. Uh, Jared Kushner, he'll be getting a different kind of New York observer behind bars. It, again, I'm saying this because I want it to happen and I want to harness the uncanny, unholy power of the show to sort of make these weird things happen. To have Trump literally testify against Jared in court yeah. and Jared's lawyer being like, Mr. Trump, do you know what a rat is? A rat will say <laughs> and do anything to get away. No, never heard of it. No. It flashback to Trump. He's like he's in Trump Tower with like 70% less gold in the room and he's like I wanted a McDouble with fries but all I could get is a Whopper <laughs> Junior and they gave me a Whopper Junior yeah. <laughs> like a regular schnook yeah. <laughs> Just, uh, Donald going to visit Jared uh, at the jail and it's the scene from Boogie Nights with the Colonel <laughs> and <laughs> Jack Horner it's like Dad, Dad, he's banging on the glass. Dad, Dad, you're my dad, right? Dad, <laughs> just hangs up and walks away. Oh, it'd be so good and so richly deserved. Yeah, oh he God, deserves it for a million things before he even became an advisor to the president. He's a rotten, rotten fucking person. Yeah, in a weird way, like the person who deserves, I guess, quote unquote, to be punished the least is Trump, Kinda. just because diminished capacity, right? <laughs> like he doesn't know. At a basic level, he does not know what he's doing. Well, I have no problem. I mean, this is the I one. Mean, I would is, shoot him. In this is the one. Yeah. It's, it's true, mentally but impaired if he person, actually I would put killed in the somebody, chair. yeah, he yeah. could definitely get off. Yeah, maybe not in Texas, but <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. You need a you need a, a, a sympathetic uh, constituency to be like, ah, oh, he doesn't know any better. Yeah, they would ask him all those basic logic questions they asked the nephew in the in the Manitowoc murder yeah. case, <laughs> and he wouldn't pass yeah. any of them. Oh my yeah. God. All right, so he'd like he'd like show his dick to the judge. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so if there are two guys guarding a bridge and one always lies and one tells the truth, I go up to one of them and I say, I have made the greatest deals in history. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no, I'm, 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 I'm Lavrov, or I'm the Russian diplomatic attache in the Oval Office. Mr. Trump, we will give you a very good present from Russian people. It's a special pen that you... Uh, you say all of your wishes into and change battery once a month. You carry with you everywhere. And if you turn upside down, you see lady, you see lady, her bikini go away. She's naked now. And then Trump go, co convenes the National Security Council and goes, guys, the Russians, they have the technology to shrink women down and put them in 
incredible. We've got to get this. Terrific. How stupid are we that we don't have this technology? <laughs> Trump, yeah, Trump, Trump goes to the National Security Council every week with like Chinese finger traps. And he's like, it's amazing. Me and Jared were stuck in it for two weeks straight. Uh, it turns out that when you bring the fingers closer, you can get out of it. But uh, I, we actually didn't do that because it's gay to touch fingers. So we had Mattis cut it with his Marine sword. I still have a bit of it on my finger forever to remember never to trust the Chinese. He's just walking around and he's got his hand caught in like the raccoon trap from where the red fern grows. Now there have been. Oh, uh, sir, are you holding on to the soda? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He'll yeah. grow back, right? <laughs> <laughs> now there has been reports. You know, he's on this trip to the Middle East right oh, now. God. Oh my God! There are this reports. There are reports that you know his advanced people are telling the foreign governments. Do not have, if Trump is holding a, a bauble or an expensive item, make sure it's not in a room with a mirror. He will drop the item in his hand to try to get the one that his reflection is holding. God. No, but there is a thing that, another article that just came out today that said his advanced team has made sure that when he's at a state dinner in Saudi Arabia, he will be allowed to have a kids menu meal of a well done steak and ketchup and this is not this is not a joke this is actually oh my a real God. thing he's ordering off the kids menu at official state dinners visiting foreign governments uh, king king solomon as you can see i completed the maze on your placemat <laughs> Pathetic. And Pathetic. I bet Obama couldn't even get to the middle of it, but I beat it. And in Extra Drain the Swamp, uh, he's a revolutionary Kekistani, and they're against him because he's destroying the uh, Washington consensus. The centerpiece of his foreign policy was, I'm going to say Islamic terrorism all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's just been revealed that the speech that he's going to give on Islam in Riyadh is... All these dipshit Pepe's are like, oh, he's gonna. This is basically he's gonna declare civilizational war. They've now announced that they're dropping all references <laughs> to Islamic terrorism. Uh, it, it's not even to like appease the Saudis. Like Mohammed bin Salman, who is Saudi Jared, uh, <laughs> it just like went up to Trump and he's like, uh, the words Islamic terrorism in Arabic they mean I'm gay. <laughs> He's like, ooh, thanks for telling me. We're no. taking that out of everything. He's going to he's gonna take a ride in Prince Muhammad's Maybach and come out and be like, folks, I'm Sunni now. <laughs> this religion, it's amazing. Look at these buildings. Look at the gold. Yeah, Shout he would out. love the buildings. The architecture for him is, is over the top. Like that like hideous perfect. hotel they built next to Burj Mecca. Burj Al Khalifa. Yeah. With the fucking like 500 you, oh, it, like Now stories. Mecca is like in the shadow. It's, like, it's the most that. tasteless, shitty. It's what he would do if he had control of Mecca was build yeah. that thing. Yeah. The Saudis really are like his bosom, like they they're love exactly. their materialist shitheads. Yeah. They're lazy, they're morons, mm -hmm. and they're incredibly tasteless and ostentatious. And uh, He's going to love these guys. Sh shout out to Jacob Bacharach, who had the, the best joke yeah. about this, where he's like, he's talking with the, the Saudis, he goes, look, this is what I've always liked about you Sunnis. The Shiites bad, their imam hidden. Your guys, it's out in the open, <laughs> I can see it. So, <laughs> Trump, you know, Jared and Saudi Jared have worked on this deal. Jared personally called the CEO of Lockheed Martin, which, you know, I really think he twisted his arm there. Really got a good deal. Um, the stated deal is $110 billion in Saudi weapons. They're going to spend on in Yemen. These are going to be ground forces in Yemen that half of them are going to be Colombian mercenaries. Half of them are going to be poor kids from EP and uh, other outskirts of the Saudi kingdom that are drafted and just fucking murked by guys in sandals. And look, if uh, I just don't think that it's that good of an idea to give advanced weaponry to an army that can't fight, you know, maybe you saw what happened when this happened in Iraq three years ago that a certain group got a hold of uh, some advanced weaponry that we gave the Iraqi military. But you know, I'm sure that I'm sure he has a very based plan. I'm sure this very cool nationalist that cucked the entire national security apparatus by doing exactly what they wanted and then some is, you know, they, they released a statement today. America and Saudi Arabia are working together to designate some Hezbollah offshoot in Leb or in Syria as a terrorist entity, which is fucking hilarious when you consider the people that Saudi Arabia has funded over there. But, you know, again, very based, incredibly based, that he's Marco Rubio with a learning disability. Let's wrap up this preface to today's episode. We're talking about the latest current events with Trump and Russia, but this all, comrade, is, is prologue to our discussion about Russia with author, author of science-type novels, 
China Mievel. Yes, let's take a trip from 2017 back 100 years ago to 1917. St. Petersburg. The skirts were short. The dames were fast. Uh, yeah, testing, testing, one, two, testing. This morning for breakfast, I had a bagel and some egg, and I had a little bit of granola. Um, and do you need more? That's more? Okay. And you're, uh, there's no issues about like, like swearing and stuff. Oh hell yeah! Oh, yeah. God, yeah. <laughs> I thought. So. I mean, I have listened to the podcast, to be clear, but I just, I suddenly, re- I just want to make sure I'm not gonna. Um, the only yeah. stuff that gets edited out is like when I make a libelous claim. Brandon can't catch all of those. <laughs> We'll see if we can make a few uh, today. Okay, we are back, and we are here now with our guest, China Mieville, to talk about his book, October, The Story of the Russian Revolution. It's me, Matt, and Amber. Felix is sitting in, but he's over in the corner. He's going he's gonna to be quiet for this one because he doesn't read books yeah. and thought we were interviewing the author of Moby Dick. I was lot, very disappointed. I had a lot of questions about how he could figure out what the whale was thinking, <laughs> uh, how he knew those sailors who lived that long ago. If he's a vampire, <laughs> he'd still be alive today. But apparently, uh, I didn't do my research right. So uh, I'm going to be conquering new worlds in Saul Band Solitaire. And I will answer one question that Felix did have ahead of time so he doesn't ask it later no Lenin is not Big Boss well I didn't you know Big Boss is a title like Dalai Lama I didn't think he was literally the one that we know right, historically cut, cut his mic we've, we've cut Felix's mic so China just to begin here like so you've written this book that is pretty much <clears throat> a straightforward history of 1917 in Russia from February to October covering the two revolutions that took place in that year you're an author that's mainly known for fiction, working in what you call weird fiction of the science fiction and sort of fantasy genres. But what you do here is return to actual history of a story that's oft written and mostly written about either fairly or unfairly through the lens of subsequent events of the 20th century, that of basically Stalinism, totalitarianism, and the fall of the Soviet Union. So why did you choose to return to this event in this moment in history and what did you want to bring to this story that you think warrants a new look or revisionism in your opinion yeah i mean it's it's true i'm i most of the things i'm known for are, 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 are fiction if people know the stuff i write it tends to be fiction i mean in this case basically uh when i was talking to my editor and friend uh, sebastian budgeon who uh, who is at Verso, the publishers, and we were, this is a few years ago, and we were talking about the fact that the centenary of the revolutionary year was coming up. And the honest truth is we thought there were going to be quite a lot of narrative histories, popular histories of this year, um, because uh, it, you know, irrespective of your politics, it was just this kind of epochally important year. Certainly if you also come at uh, politics uh, from the left, from the radical left, as as I do, as he does, then this becomes more than just an epochally important event. It's also a very inspiring and and sort of an event, the shadow of which we still live in. So we wanted to write, I wanted to write like a narrative history uh, that was historically rigorous. So read an enormous amount of the literature and there's no invention in this in the sense that none of the people, none of the quotes, none of the events are made up. They're all in the literature somewhere. But has the new reader particularly in mind and therefore tells it as a story because whatever else you can say about 1917 it it was as well as everything else just an absolutely incredible story it's like a thriller you know Mm -hmm. and this kind of increasing pace and so on so um so on one level it just had a kind of fairly prosaic uh idea which is you know to, to introduce this story to tell this story of course you know this is not a narrative history for leftists it's a narrative history for anyone who's interested But it is a narrative history by a leftist, and so some of that uh, (coughs) politics and texture comes in, particularly in the epilogue, but it's kind of woven in throughout. Well, you mentioned, I think, one of the things that you do with this book that's great by telling it as a story, like writing it as a narrative, month by month, uh, sometimes even hour by hour, in terms of some of the more intense revolutionary moments, is that I think... For the reader, it allows them to experience these this, these moments of liberation and emancipation in the moment and without, like I said, through the lens of the rest of the history of the 20th century to sort of experience that as the people themselves did at the time. Well, I hope so. I mean, one of the advantages, I think, well, I, the, the, the wager of doing this 
um, as not just a novelist, but also as a non-specialist, as a non-historian, as a non-Russian specialist. So therefore somebody who was, I had a passing knowledge and reasonable familiarity, but I was, uh, I was engaging with this literature and this field largely from new. And part of the, one of the wagers was that that sense of discovery and that sense of increasing pace and that sense of uncovering these things that I was experiencing could also kind of come out through the writing. Um, Narrative history is interesting because there is a tradition on the left that is extremely suspicious of narrative history and sees it as a kind of intrinsically conservative form. And I don't poo-poo that. I think that's a very serious and important critique and analytical position. The wager, another wager of this book, is um, speaking as someone who has both loved and learnt a lot from narrative histories for all their, uh, for all their limitations, is that there is also maybe something more, uh, there's a surplus, there is a, there is a, there is a use and, and an importance to them, even if we, take a, we cast a kind of critical eye. The other thing is that in, in normally I think what's, I guess, new or, or returning to a different style is that you're writing about a story about a revolution that is not necessarily presented as a warning from history that you're not writing about the Russian Revolution, that everything that happened after it was inevitable as a necessary fact of the revolution itself. And in the, you mentioned the epilogue where you do bring in some of that subsequent history and politics, and I just want to quote from it briefly here. You, said, you write, October is still ground zero for arguments about fundamental radical social change. Its degradation was not a given and was not written in any stars. The story of the hopes, struggles, strains, and defeats that follow 1917 have been told before and will be again. That story, and above all the questions arising from it, it's the urgencies of change and how change is possible and the dangers that will beset it stretch vastly beyond us. So, again, it's just this idea that a story of rev like the, the story of revolution doesn't necessarily like have to be one that is always about how ch if you try to change the established order of things or if you try to make a serious change that things will always get worse no absolutely something i've said in uh, quite the opposite i mean for me as i say i make no bones about the fact that you know in what i hope is a non dogmatic and not uncritical way nonetheless to me the the revolution the october revolution is a source of intense inspiration and 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 uh, political importance um, but one of the things I've said quite a lot is that I have no issue with arguing and debating with you know a, a serious right-wing historian who will offer serious reasons as to why this didn't work what happened you know because I you know of course on the left you know we also think it didn't we, we have our own reasons for what we think happened afterwards but if somebody thinks like it was doomed to fail and here's why here are the reasons based on you know rigorous history that's fine that's a, that's a serious debate what is unconscionable and sickening is this exactly as you say the evasion of analysis by a kind of history through aphorism by sort of saying you know ah so tragic revolutions always eat their children mm. you know um which is a kind of slander against uh the desire for change um and a piece of in intense stupidity masquerading as wisdom. And that, that notion of a given, that notion of a nostrum really disgusts me. Well, and hegemony to children too. <laughs> yeah, I, I was really interested in this group of journalists that, uh, that were trying to rally to celebrate the centenary in, in Russia because the Kremlin basically decided to sit it out. And it's incredibly strange because right now we have a renewed interest from s some so-called liberal media class people in drumming up another Cold War. And it's based off of all this old Soviet kind of, um, you know, imagery. And, and it's incredibly strange. And it's kind of difficult to pinpoint what the legacy is right now, especially considering the renewed tensions based on an entirely different political context? I mean, the relationship of the Russian state to October is very interesting, which is essentially uh, as far as they can get away with one of disavowal. You simply don't engage with it. And, and Putin himself has, uh, has, has, you know, when he does talk about Lenin, it is to excoriate him, uh, you know, essentially as not a great, uh, not, not a Russian chauvinist, not someone who wanted Russia to win the war, you know. Um, but I was in, but, but there's a paradox because, you know, there's also uh, among the kind of Putin clique, um, there's an immense nostalgia for precisely for that kind of great Russian chauvinism, which means that while Lenin is verboten, 
Stalin has his fans. So you have this very peculiar situation in, in this kind of intense gangster capitalist state that quite a lot of its apparatchiks kind of think, you know, Stalin, uh, you know, had a lot going for him. When I was in St. Petersburg for researching for the book, um, and I was talking to some Russian comrades and friends, and, and I was saying, well, you know, what will the state say? How will it deal with October if it is forced to? If someone says, you know, this, this event happened, what, what do you say about it? And they paused and they said, well, you know, what, the, what they'll say is, you know, there was this kind of tragic fight. There was this kind of enormous uh, kind of argument and upheaval. And then uh, after a time, Russia won. <laughs> That's how you're going to mediate it. Okay. That's one way to do it. But uh, getting into that, the actual history itself, um, the book opens with Russia at sort of the dawn of the 20th, 20th century. And it's one that almost could be its own sort of sci science fiction narrative in that it's like a world that seems somewhat like our own, but strangely more brutal and everyone's names sound different than ours. So could you sketch just a little bit for us, like what Russia at the beginning of the 20th century looked like? This sort of like vast empire that was at once kind of cosmopolitan, but also huge swaths of it in almost sort of medieval serfdom or... Well, that's a good description. Yeah. I mean, it was this enormous, enormous empire that sort of, uh, you know, under the kind of sway ideologically of the Orthodox Church, but also encompassing Buddhists and, you know, thousands and thousands of, of Jews and Muslims and dissenting sects and, uh, uh, you know, Lithuanians, Latvians, um, uh, you know, Azerbaijanis. I mean, like, you know, incredibly cosmopolitan. And then in the, in the major cities, particularly... Petersburg or Petrograd, um, there was a kind of, you know, uh, exactly as you'd expect, a kind of uh, radical culture, uh, sort of, you know, alternative scene. There was amazing kind of modernist art and so on going on, not just in the cities, but particularly um, in, in terms of, you know, poetry and painting and so on. And at the same time, you know, this is all being ruled over by an absolute autocratic Tsar who had powers that were uh, more medieval than, you know, what, what we would normally think of as a king or a queen or something. Um, you know, the absolute head of this incredibly sclerotic regime, which meant that it was a, a regime of kind of intense infighting among um, his, uh, you know, lieutenants and grand viziers and so on. Um, the interesting thing about Russia in, you know, from 19, well, in the, at the beginning of the 20th century up to scant weeks before February, the first of these two revolutions to, to rock the, um, uh, the country, the empire, was that everyone who wasn't an idiot knew something was going to happen. There, there's no mystery about that. And, you know, on the right, on the hard right, on the fascist right, through to the, the, the radical left, there was a sense that, like, you know, this situation cannot, cannot hold. Uh, and a lot of liberals in, in the middle also saying the same thing. But the specifics of what actually happened, um, for one thing, were, were uh, enormously contested. What was to happen, what could happen, what might happen. And the second thing was, in its specifics, it came in many cases as a profound shock. So you have radicals on the ground who are dealing very, very closely with, uh, with demonstrations and, and, and trade union activity and so on, saying weeks, really days in some cases before February 1917, yeah, nothing much is going to happen at the moment. It's all quite quiet. And then you have this eruption on International Women's Day um, of grassroots women activists and workers from which this entire conflagration, which overthrows 500 years of autocratic monarchy in a, in a, in, in a matter of days. I mean, it, it is unbelievable the scale and pace of this. I mean, that is one of the amazing things reading about you know, the, these few days in February and October is like the pace at which these, the sort of dizzying speed at which these events happen seemingly out of control of the participants themselves. But just returning to like this idea about this, the culture that was ar arising in Russia at the end of the 19th and early 20th century, you describe kind of a, a blossoming of urban culture as sort of industry and foreign capital pour into places like Moscow, Moscow and St. Petersburg. And you write that in its wake come more reading circles, cells of agitators, gatherings of variously like-minded, aghast at a world of ruthless exploitative capital and the subordination of need to profit. And all throughout it, like you, you describe this sort of kaleidoscope of groups and councils and organizations ranging, like as you said, across the spectrum from radical to liberal. 
And like, could you talk a little bit about how 1905 and the sort of insurrections that happened there were in some ways kind of a preamble, like almost a decade earlier? Yeah, 1905, what Trotsky called the dress rehearsal for the revolution was this, it was was uh, essentially a kind of abortive revolution. It was um, uh, an you know, from the early 20th century, you have a, a growth under this kind of influx of capital uh, and, and, and earlier wars that Russia's engaged in, like, you know... The one they lost to Japan, quite lost embarrassingly. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, you know, having essentially through a kind of racist imperialism thought that it would be easy. I and mean, this Saar referred to the Japanese as monkeys. And there's this sense that, like, you know, we need a useful little war against a lesser race, essentially. This went catastrophically wrong because the regime was so... Uh, so ossified and and so um, sort of degenerated, um, and so there was this growing uh, radicalism, and uh, a, a lot of this revolved around a growing sense of the necessity of um, j- just just the absolute necessity of change, and this took very peculiar forms. So you you famously, you know, there were arguments in the regime of how do you best control these these drives. And so they set up what's sometimes called police unions, this extraordinary thing, which is basically a kind of a union for the, um, for the, for the articulation of complaints, particularly among working class uh, uh, workers and so on, um, but arranged by the police. Um, but the thing is that to have any semblance of, of reality at all, these had to actually articulate complaints, which meant you had this bizarre paradox that these these police unions ended up becoming the the route in some cases for quite explosive actions. Ultimately, 1905 um, kicked off. You know, th- there there was this uh, very very dramatic um, march that was uh, across the the frozen river in St. Petersburg. That was uh, where hundreds, probably at least maybe one and a half thousand people, shot down by the um, the imperial guard. Um, and this was a huge turning point. This was a point in which what had, of course, there were the groups of radicals, there were the groups of Marxists and uh, socialist revolutionaries, as they were called, like radical peasant, uh, pro-peasant parties. But what 1905 did was it shattered a lot of illusions among a lot of people who knew that change had to come, but who didn't, who wanted to essentially beseech the Tsar and the regime for change. And you know, when they marched across the river because it was frozen, they were. They, th- this is exactly what they were doing. They weren't saying down with the Tsar. They were. They were carrying placards saying, "You know, little father, please help us." <laughs> who was the? It was a. It was an Orthodox priest, I think, who father was leading Gapon. it. Who is, it, as you said, sort of beseeching. And then after it happened, and he yeah. saw these people get gunned down, he literally said, "There, we have no Tsar. We have no Tsar." Yeah, Father Gapon is one of those characters who, the story of of the revolution and and indeed its preceding years is like punctuated by these characters that just cry out for books of their own. These incredible characters, and Father Gapon, who was a a priest, as you say, was this extraordinary character who uh, had a kind of a kind of social ministry, a kind of uh, a, a, a initially quite hesitant but sincere pro-worker sort of um, theology, uh, but was very anti-radical, um, but then was, was, was shocked to the core by these events of 1905. Ultimately, you know, he associated with a load of radicals and ended up in a, in a, in a weird, sad way being, being killed by his own... Um, his own comrades because he was also a police agent, but it's very unclear the extent to which he really understood what it was to be a police agent. Like it's a very odd story. One of many very odd stories. And the initial draft of the book was twice or three times as thick (laughs) and those stories were gone into, but you know, one didn't want to end up with a brick. So unfortunately some of that had to be winnowed out. Um, So from 1905 on, like again, there's a sort of a cycle of reaction with sort of a lot of reactionary violence and pogroms specifically directed against Jews. There's the Black Hundreds, the Kishinev program, pogrom, probably one of the most famous in world history. And always with sort of a wink and a nod from the state itself, this sort of ultra reactionary, you know, violence against certain minority groups. A lot of the leaders, the most famous actors in the revolution are in exile at this point, which is all leading us up to 1917, which is where the book really begins and the events in Petrograd, St. Petersburg. And the other th- one thing I wanted to ask you about is much of your fiction is centered on these fictional cities, whether it's the city in the city, embassy town, the cities that you describe in the, uh, the Boz Log trilogy. And I was just wondering, 
Petrograd, St. Petersburg, in this book, definitely emerges as quite a character itself. And I want to tell you, like, how do you see cities as part of your writing? And what was it like to write about a real city and a place in time in a, as a kind of fictional place? Does that make sense? Uh, I think so. I mean, certainly cities loom very large in my, in my, in my writing, in my fiction, and have done uh, ever since I started writing. Um, and although to a certain extent it took other people to point that out to me, which I think is often the way with the stuff you're doing yourself, but I've become increasingly conscious of it. Um, I'm, I grew up in London and I love uh, big cities. I've spent time living in various large cities and I like that kind of particular unique flavor of exhaustion that a big city can provoke and that kind of cosmopolitanism and that sort of sense of acceleration and that the peculiar pleasures of a certain type of urban anomie as well. The, the very thing that people that don't like cities don't like about cities is one of the things I, like a lot of others, do rather like about mm -hmm. cities, etc., etc. So I am very much a kind of city animal. Um, in terms of the relationship to St. Petersburg, um, you know, telling the story, St. Petersburg, it was the crucible, but it was very important not to reduce it to that. So the book does constantly kind of spin out to all these other areas of the of the empire um, and then kind of spin back in again because, because the capital was where it particularly happened. Now, one of the things that was was interesting to me is I went to St. Petersburg, as I was, I was saying, to, to sort of for research for the book. Um, and there's a little part of me that wants to be a kind of contrarian rationalist and say that, you know, you don't need to go to a place to write about it, right? If you look at the photos and you read the guidebooks, why do you know, like, w there's no such thing as the soul of a city, right? There's to out, that, that's <laughs> There's totally such a thing as the soul of a city. I mean, this is the, because I can't sustain that. I can't sustain that contrarianism because being there, being in the streets, I don't for a second suggest it gave me some kind of, you know, unique insight that other people can't have, but there was a specificity to it, a specificity to the urban rhythms, the rhythms of walking in a city that is punctuated by canals, the rhythm, the specificity of a city with a, a skyline that is that high and no higher and no less high and wide streets so you can see for miles and this particular kind of facade and these, there is a specificity that the moment I was there and over the, the, the course of being there, I, it, it had an, an intense impact on the book and immediately I was altering the draft and, and there is a specificity to to being there that uh, I just hold up my hands and say I can't explain it in, in rational terms, I can't explain it in, in rigorous, reductive terms, but it absolutely changed the book and changed me. I want to just, again, read a scene now from uh, Petrograd, from a city becoming kind of an insurgent city as the first February Revolution uh, kicks off, or sorry, the February Revolution kicks off. You write... Under the darkening sky, accompanied by breaking glass and in the guttering light of fires, groups of men and women drifted aimlessly, together and apart. Workers, freed criminals, radical agitators, soldiers, freelance hooligans, spies and drunkards, armed with what they had found. Here, a figure in a greatcoat waving an officer's saver and an empty revolver. There, a young teenager with a kitchen knife, a student with machine gun bullets slung around his waist, a rifle in each hand. A man wielded a pole for cleaning tram lines as if it were a pike. Yeah, and to be clear, part of the, one of the rules, as I was saying, one of the rules I set for myself is that I, I don't get to invent any local color. I don't get to invent anything. Um, what I can do is express the color, the, speci the specifics as best I can. But every one of those figures, very directly, is described in the eyewitness testimony. So that, that student wearing the machine gun bullets, the guy beautifully, you know, wielding a, a tram line cleaner as if it was a kind of, you know, as I say, as if it was a pike, as if it was a, a lance. These are described in, in, in the literature. So all of those, that sense of kind of insurgent apocalypse comes through in the eyewitness testimonies um, incredibly vividly. And the thing about St. Petersburg that came through, I haven't been there, but the thing that I took reading it in terms of your evoking like the energies and, and, the, and the way that its architecture and geography sort of uh, influenced people and vice versa is just when people were agitated, when, when it became the moment when people sort of collectively realized that they were going to sort of make themselves, make them voices heard, is those wide boulevards it, and all pointing towards the 
the the organs of state, the big the 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 headquarters of of of, of state power. It just seems like they were these vectors that like. W- it, the the specificity you speak of of St. Petersburg is that if you wanted to march, you knew where to go because of the way the city was laid out. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, at all? that's absolutely right. And I mean, it was you know, so it was famously a planned city and an incredibly counterintuitive planned city. Like if you were going to plan a city, you wouldn't plan it there and you wouldn't plan it like that. But they did. Um, and as you say, what that meant is that it has this very uh, th- th- this center. In which all these 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 grand, incredibly grand, very beautiful, wide boulevards like lead, and at the time it was ringed around with various, variously militant working class districts and so on. So they they tended, to, not always, but generally speaking, you know, if you're going to have a march, if you want to kind of make yourself heard, you know, the question is, you know, how do you get to the centre? And then to kind of increase that sense of drama, as if it was being scripted by a rather on-the-nose scriptwriter, you know, you have these bridges over the river, uh, which whoever's in control of the mechanisms of the bridge can open them. They can open the bridges so you can't get across. So there's, repeatedly, there's the battles for the bridges, you know, who's going to get control of the bridges. Um, It's one of the many moments, that kind of detail, where if you were writing it as fiction, uh, any editor with a taste for subtlety would sort of say, yeah, it's a little much. You need to (laughs) dial that down, really, you know. Yeah, Yeah. I think the Russian Revolution was kind of heavy-handed. I'm just going to say it. A little little on the nose. (laughs) There's just, uh, there's one other scene um, from the February chapter that I I just want to share here. Uh, Going on just a little ways away is this sort of, again, planned city of uh, Kronstadt, which is this giant naval base, and like sort of this walled naval base city that you write was notorious for the brutality of the officer class there against the sailors and enlisted men. And uh, you write here, in September of 1916, Governor General Viren had reported to his superiors that one tremor from Petrograd would be enough and Kronstadt would rise against me, the officers, the government, and anyone else. The fortress is a powder magazine in which a wick is burning down. Less than half a year later, in the small hours between February and March, Viren was hauled out of his villa in nothing but a white shirt. He drew himself up and bellowed a familiar order, attention. This time, the men just laughed. They marched him into the anchor square, shivering in his underwear, uh, sorry, shivering in his underclothes in the sea winds and sentenced him to death for his brutality. They told him to face the great monument to Admiral Makarov, engraved with his motto, remember war. Viren refused. When the Kronstadt soldiers bayoneted him, he made them meet his eyes. So, like, again, just like, that, I, that, that was a great scene that, again, read to me like a really like amazing scene in like a, a novel or movie or something marching that guy out in his undershirt. I mean, and as you mentioned, like they had what a year earlier executed a hundred sailors for yeah. some kind of mutiny. Yeah. I mean, cr- one of the things that comes up again and again, particularly in the run up to uh, February is, uh, but before then as well is it's not just that the regime, <laughs> sorry, I've just seen your cat. <laughs> <laughs> Hey. That's um, Phyllis. There's okay. another one who might try and climb on right. him too. Okay. Yeah, he's, he, he loves new people, and he particularly okay. loves men. He's very homosocial, so okay. it's okay. We have lint rollers. Right. <laughs> um, sorry, so one of the things that comes through is that the regime in the run-up to uh, February was not only incredibly cruel and you know despotic and utterly unconcerned with any kind of dignity of life for the great majority of its citizens. It was all those things, but it wasn't only those things. It was also, within its own terms, incredibly stupid. You know, there was no mystery about this. The right are saying, uh, you know, like, uh, as you say from this quote, you know, the the career soldiers, uh, you know, most, many of them, you know, brutal, you know, horrendous figures. Not all. Some had more honor and treated their um, their men better than that, but, but not many. Yeah, you know, you mentioned that, like, some of the favored officers were spared and the rest right, were thrown right. in a ditch and shot, basically. Absolutely. Like, but they're saying, like, we can't, you know, something's going to happen. We, you know, there's a bit, this is a powder keg. And this, and you see this, you know, within, within, uh, Petrograd itself, um, you know, you've got these famous speeches by the liberals sort of saying, you know, is this stupid, Milutin saying, is this stupidity or is it treason? Um, You know, uh, so if you were going to be an autocratic ruler of a vast sprawling empire, you know, concatenated by history and cruelty um, across this great swathe of territory, and you were going to do it, 
you know, sensibly, you wouldn't run it like this, you know, as well as anything else. Aspiring autocrats, pick up October for rules on what not to do. You gotta have I mean, a sense Kron- of self-preservation. <laughs> Kronstadt, is a, Kronstadt recurs throughout the story because it was this, it was a kind of, if it was a kind of uh, a crucible because you have, uh, I've already used that metaphor. It was a petri dish. It was something very. Uh, it, it, all of the tensions that were present around the country and that were there in Petersburg, Petrograd, were heightened in this incredible way in Kronstadt. Plus, because of the way communications worked, when the Kronstadt sailors had their their revolution, it was it was just after, like a day or two after what had gone on in in, in St. Petersburg, and they didn't know how things were going. Like there was a very real sense that this might be a doomed enterprise, but nonetheless, you cannot take any more. You do this, you have to do it. And what that means is that in, in a certain sense, like they get referred to like by Trotsky and by various others as the soul or the heart of the revolution at various points. That's not mere poetry. Like this is, if it, in, a, in a way, a kind of super distillate of all of those, those pressures. And when the, which is why the, the Kronstadt sailors became this kind of incredibly powerful symbol as well as, you know, a body of armed sailors. So when, the, when Kronstadt is here, things have changed. You know, when the Kronstadt mm-hmm. sailors sail over to the mainland, then, you know, th- then the tide can change sort of thing. So, so that sense of Kronstadt is coming recurs. <laughs> uh, you alluded to it uh, just a little uh, a while ago, but like the, 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 the Russian libs, okay? The, 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 the libs, there were libs back then. And uh, another theme that emerges that is that in the midst of this revolutionary moment, there is almost even more intense competition, dueling, and you know heresy and and excommunications of people, you know essentially on the side of wanting change, but asking the question how much change and how do we do it? And like there, like as I mentioned before, there's this sort of kaleidoscope of various councils, and what emerges is the Duma Provisional Council, and then there's the sort of they got people in the streets like the Soviets. Because you talk a bit about like how that those tensions formed and then played out and then like informed much of the rest of the history of the left yeah well uh, this is you know immensely complicated and i this this is necessarily highly schematic but basically you know um you, you i think you have to distinguish the kind of the liberals and the left um and that the liberals in in russia at the time were one of the they, they were they were weak and they historically you know with a few honorable exceptions but as an organized movement when push came to shove, they would make their peace with reaction. This happened again and again and again, um, and would recur throughout this year. Um, uh, and and I'm always, just as an aside, I'm always, people often ask about analogies, you know, what are the lessons for today? And I'm quite nervous about kind of glib analogizing. I think that, that you know, this is, a, this is about the particularities of the, of the time and place. That said, that tendency for the sort of organizations and and mass, if you like, of liberalism, Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, whether with a sense of tragic necessity or with a kind of disavowed glee to make peace with reaction, including brutal, sadistic reaction, rather than with radical change, is a recurrent theme throughout history way beyond the Russian Revolution. So you've got the liberals, and then on the other, and then you've got the the left, and the left itself is highly fractured. Um, So essentially, if you like, well, the Mensheviks and a lot of people around them, the, another party called the, the, the Socialist Revolutionaries, the mainstream of them, uh, the Mensheviks, who were Marxists, um, held this opinion that essentially Russia was not ready for a socialist revolution and that therefore it was imperative that liberalism take charge, have its liberal revolution, and then we can see... It. Like, this is, this is to be unfairly crude, but in the time available. Mm-hmm. Whereas then you have the kind of hard left... Uh, the Bolsheviks and also some within the S- the Socialist Revolutions, the SRs, who took different positions and in various ways wanted, you know, did w- did not want to throw in their lot with to kind of collaborate with liberalism uh, and with the liberals and to s- and said, you know, it's 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 up to us to to take power uh, and various disagreements about what you do then. Um, what you had in, you know, in the aftermath of February, you have this extraordinary situation that became known as dual power for several months, where you, you have two different coexisting organs of state. You have essentially a kind of the provisional government, a kind of liberal, uh, a, pretty, a pretty unstable and, and uh, chaotic, but nonetheless a sort of vaguely notionally liberal bourgeois government. And you have 
the Soviet, the Petrograd Soviet, and Soviets all around the country, but which were in various different ways uh, grassroots councils of workers and peasants and soldiers and other groups voted up um, to have a kind of participatory democ democratic model sort of thing. Um, but one of the paradoxes early on um, for the first half or so of the year is that most of the activists doing the running in the Soviet hold to the opinion that they cannot take power. And so you have this very strange position where you have these two organs are vying, for, are vying if you like, for kind of hegemony, to use a term that you, you used earlier, Amber. Um, and in many, in many cases, people on the ground are orienting towards the Soviet, like even, you know, whether there was a big march for women's suffrage and they marched to the Soviet because they know that's what, ha that's what ha has the ear of the streets, that's where the sort of popular power lies. But the Soviet itself, the bulk of its, uh, of its organizing members were, ex were extremely reluctant, you know, to take power because they felt that uh, it was kind of theoretically, historically not possible, not appropriate. So you end up with this incredible scene in July when there's this enormous upheaval in the city where one of the leaders of the Soviet is basically out in the streets being surrounded by thousands of angry workers. And one of them is, this is a very famous scene, you see it in a lot of the histories, shaking his fist in his face and saying, take power, you son of a bitch, when it is given to you. Um, and so part of the story of Russia in 1917 is the extraordinary story, not just of dual power in the sense of jostling powers, but the specifics of dual power in the sense that those who had the potential to take power and yet for sometimes honorable, sometimes cowardly reasons, did, did not feel that they could or wanted to and therefore abjured it. Um, and it leads to this incredibly complex um, and profoundly kind of accelerating and urgent situation. So after a time, the question becomes, you know, who is willing to take power? And that brings us to, you know, one of the, the main characters in this story. Uh, we referred to Big Boss earlier, but, you know, Lenin himself is a figure who, you know, of, with, of which this question was incredibly pertinent. And, you know, there, you provide, I mean, there are a lot of other characters that people, Stalin, Trotsky, Kerensky, the Tsar and his family all show up. But Lenin in particular, I want to ask you about, like, so much of the action um, in this history takes place in meetings, councils, debates, speeches, newspaper articles. So to put it in a term our uh, listeners are, can relate to, posting. <laughs> and if we could imagine Lenin as both a relentless poster and ruthless forum mod. He loved to delete other people's comments. He loved to change things that people have already written. But I was just wondering, like, for you, what, how, what, what, what was Lenin like to write about, again, in, in this context? Did anything surprise you? Like, what kind, how did you see him as a, as a character? So I, I uh, as an old man, I barely understood a word you just said. But, um, okay. I'm imagining right. Lenin as an angry internet yeah, commenter. Yeah. No, no, I, I yeah. think I got that. Um, well, it, it, it's very interesting because from the right, you know, Lenin is the great hate figure, and indeed the lib liberal from liberal, like Lenin. Uh, you know, you can you can rehabilitate various other, you know, and kind of domesticate various other kind of figures, including even to a certain extent Trotsky. You know, but Lenin is largely uh, the f a figure of, of demonology. And then conversely, um, not only in the Soviet Union as was, but also among a lot of what I think of as the cosplay left, um, <laughs> Lenin becomes, you know, the favorite costume or, you know, this kind of, uh, this figure who can do no wrong, this, you know, amazing saint. Now, I am an enormous admirer of Lenin. I think he had an uh, astonishing political antenna, um, an amazing sense of like weak links and and uh, fulcrum points and so on. Um, Agreed. Just so you know, official position of Chapo Trap House is we are very pro Daddy Lennon. <laughs> <laughs> he was an amazing figure. Um, what what he wasn't was a flawless figure, and he he was as you say he could be not just a question of saying oh you know from the perspective of our kind of um, uh, of of our uh, niceties of early 21st century, you know, we're, we're, we're too soft. Like at the time, lots of his comrades were sort of saying, you need to stop being so splenetic, like this isn't <laughs> helping, you know. Um, and he could certainly make mistakes, you know, for, he had this amazing antenna, but nonetheless, there are certain, and I try and talk about them in the book, there are certain times when he's just flatly wrong um, and in, uh, in a couple of occasions. Nonetheless, you know, so I, I suppose what I wanted to do was, I didn't want to be hagiographical. It was very important to me that this was a sort of 
you know, non-eulogizing version of Lenin, but I certainly wasn't interested in the kind of um, the, uh, the, the demonology version either, um, that this is an incredibly impressive political activist and analyst. Um, and uh, um, and he, I think there are reasons he's this key figure. It's interesting that, you know, Marxists in general are have traditionally been very uneasy indeed with the idea of the the theory of you know history as put forward by individuals by the the, the great men and women of history and yet a, a lot of people on the left uh, myself included and trotsky and uh, i know tarek ali takes this position very various others would say with various degrees of hesitation that probably all the usual caveats about counterfactuals being stated. If Lenin hadn't been in Petrograd at the, in the early part of 1917, it, it's not at all. It, it's probable that October wouldn't have happened. Ultimately. Well, you can see that when you're sketching out just how hesitant everybody, even to the Bolsheviks, was about the idea of taking yep. power. Like, and I think part of that probably was doctrinaire Marxist conviction that there needed to be a stage, but also, I mean. How the hell do you go from being a yeah. totally alienated, you know, activist with no government experience, no, no uh, tradition of, of actual ruling, and then being told, okay, now we're going to take over? I can see how you would stop short. But then Lenin coming to St. Petersburg, it's almost like on a dime things start changing. One of, it, it's very important to – one of the things that comes through very much if you're reading uh, the histories is the extent to which – uh, Bolshevism, all the all the parties, but Bolshevism, which is sometimes depicted as this kind of monolithic sort of you know under the under uh, current under the directorate of this single person, total nonsense. I mean the debates, the arguments, the uh, often very splenetic, um, the, the sense of uh, kind of jostling and um, uh, the questions over which way are we going to go, what are we going to do? And you're absolutely right. You know from from his arrival. Um, Lenin shocked a lot of the moderates of his own party with his positions. And, and these were the moderates who were doing the kind of cultural running. Theirs was the dominant position, which was not one of collaboration with liberalism, but one of essentially a certain type of quietism. Now you can, there's a, there's a live debate about the extent to which there was, if you like, continuity Bolshevism or a, a rupture. Um, I think it can be unhelpfully counterposed, but there's no question, and people on the ground at the time were very, very clear that you know uh, that that Lenin was taking a minority position and had to kind of wrestle within his own party to kind of persuade people. Then later on in the year, when it comes to uh, you know the decision to actually move to an insurrection, uh, same thing. He he puts his case very strongly. Uh, he uh, um, persuades various waverers. Uh, not everyone. Some people vote against him, but um, that position gets put. So one of the things, it, it's a bit nerve-wracking to think that you can make an interesting uh, historical story out of committees and um, you know debates in closed rooms and so on. All I can say is I found them you know, unbearably thrilling because of the stakes of what it is that's being discussed and debated. And this is a, and we're very fortunate because people minuted these things to a kind of neurotic uh, degree. <laughs> so there's an enormous kind of paper trail of this stuff. Um, and to the extent that this is what I hope it is, which is something of a thriller, albeit a thriller to which we know the outcome, um, many of the scenes that I found the most thrilling are like, who's going to vote which way in this room? And I, one thing that's str really striking reading the recounting of these debates is how you can really imagine yourself basically taking any of these positions about how like difficult these questions are and how many different things were pulling in every direction and like this sense like for example among the bolsheviks of like we really are are we ready to take power but at the same time seeing like workers in the streets and the soldiers kind of moving past them and like that need to like get ahead of them before they just totally you know are outpaced by events yeah you, there's you know at various points of the year uh lenin but also as you say lots of the other activists and i, I do want to stress not only the bolsheviks you know the, there's an immense there's an amazing history here of the socialist revolutionary party particularly the left socialist revolutionaries under maria spiridonova one of the, the, the great figures of russian history this amazing activist you know that there, there is this constant sense of like now it is our job 
to, to push people, to push them further. Whoa, now it's our job to rein them in. They're going, much. we can't possibly keep up with that. They need to slow down now. And that kind of titration almost is, is um, all the way through. And then, it, and then it, there's also the question of actually judging quite where people are. So the, the ultimate debate about whether or not to stage an insurrection is partly down to you know a perfectly reasonable debate as you as you say no one was being stupid here a reasonable debate about like quite how ready are people like that's a very complicated question you know because there's what people are saying what they're doing reports back from the factories reports from the rest of the empire and so on and so forth it was really like it was at the end of it it was going to be a gamble you were only going to find out when you started it and and you were going to see what the response was. And that's, I can't imagine how terrifying that would be because what if you're wrong? Well, that's part, I think that's in the nature of any uh, revolutionary change and, um, you know, uh, any radical moment is that it is always a wager. It's always a gamble. Um, and not only a gamble in terms of a reading of the situation as you go in, but also a gamble that by acting now, you will change enough of that situation that even if things look less than ideal now, you can rest them into, rest W-R-E-S-T. <laughs> you, can, you can pull them into such a different configuration that actually you can kind of shock even yourselves and history by how much you can do by taking this gamble. But it absolutely is a gamble, yeah. The stakes are high and you will probably lose. <laughs> but do it anyway. There's a, just, well, the, the, just to pick up on that, I mean, there, there, is a, there is, and Lenin himself talks about this in 1923. You're, you're absolutely right, it's like, not just do it anyway on the grounds that like, why not? But do it anyway on the grounds that we cannot not. The situation, right. you know, even if the situation is not ideal, it is unbearable. Right. And therefore, this isn't sure, we yeah. would love things to be like in a different configuration. That would increase our chances. But unfortunately, we don't have that luxury. This is where we are and we cannot stay here like this. Yeah, it's currently inhumane. Just one uh, quick story about Lenin that I, I, I really love that I want to share with our listeners here that uh, you, you relate in the book. Uh, this is, you know, in October... Lenin is staying in disguise in the city in a woman's apartment. And uh, he's finally, basically, against the instructions of the, the CC, decides to basically go out into the streets at like the, the pivotal moment to take to the streets. It says, uh, directly contravening CC instructions, not for the first time, he did up his coat and placed a note on his hostess's table. I have gone, it read, where you did not want me to go, which I thought was very, very metal. And then, among us. And then immediately after that, you write, in a wig, battered cap, and ragged clothes, bandages swathed around his face in a crude disguise, like fucking Dark Man or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lenin set out together with his Finnish comrade, Aino Raha, forgive me if I mispronounce that, but the two men crossed Viberg in a swaying, near-empty tram. When, through trance remarks, the conductor revealed that she was a leftist, Lenin compulsively began to question her about and lecture her on the political situation. So, like I said, he's a poster. He loves well, to post. He's extremely online. And lecture women. So <laughs> he is an ex He's an extremely online guy, a hundred years before there was such a thing. One of the funny details of that terrible, terrible disguise is that it totally worked. They were stopped. Yeah, no, they got through they a checkpoint. They were stopped and, um, and they were just essentially waved through by uh, opposing soldiers because he looked like this strange, shambling drunk. <laughs> so I guess... That's also my plan. <laughs> So I guess to wrap things, to, to, to close things out here, like I said, you, you, you write this book with a clear perspective on who you're rooting for, on who your heroes and villains are, but at the same time, conscious of having it not verge into apologia or hagiography. But one thing that you make very clear in, in, the, in the epilogue is what the revolution did accomplish. And you write here, fleetingly, there is a shift towards workers' control of production and the rights of peasants to the land, equal rights for men and women in work and in marriage, the right to divorce, maternity support, the decriminalization of homosexuality 100 years ago, moves towards national self-determination, free and universal ex education, the expansion of literacy, and with literacy, a cultural explosion, a thirst to learn, the mushrooming of universities and lecture series and adult schools. And reading that... I really think that like the real spec the, the, the specter that haunts of, of the Russian Revolution that haunts a lot of the things that people write about it are perhaps not the gulags or the secret police, but just what you described. Yes, I think that's a good point. I think, you know, again, with all the concern about glib analogies, one of there's no question that uh, there are large forces arrayed against any 
aspiration for emancipation for which that emancipation itself is a threat and something to be crushed and increasingly I think crushed as sadistically as possible as performatively as possible there is a one of one of the um, resonances that I found throughout the reading for this book um, and that I hope comes through in the book is this the sheer sense of apocalypticism, um, often expressed in explicitly religious terms because this was an extremely devout country. Um, uh, these unbearably moving letters written by like soldiers at the front and so on, talking about this kind of striving for a kingdom of God, for a new Jerusalem, for a, for a millennial upheaval, for a kind of utopian moment, and yet it's been deflected and you know, you're still living in the mud and shit and blood. Um, and there is a debate in the UK. The magazine Prospect had a debate between uh, a friend, my friend Richard Seymour and, and, and David Aronovich. And the, the question was, you know, should we regret the, uh, the revolution? Now, to me, no matter what your politics are, I mean, okay, leaving aside the hard right, the idea that no matter how critical you want to be, the idea that you, you would relate to this this glimmer of alterity, this sense of like, you know, the, the desperate, utter reconfiguring, to a groping towards something new, some emancipation. The idea that your relationship to that is one straightforwardly of regret is so pitiful, you know. Mm. And I am not saying that one cannot be you know, critical and analytical, that in fact is exactly the task. It's one of the things I try and do in the epilogue is to say what happened, why, what went wrong, why did it go wrong, when did it go wrong, what were the pressures, what can we blame the Bolsheviks for, the other parties, what can we ex explain, and so on. But the idea that you look at this and you say, well, that was to be regretted, mm. bespeaks, I, I mean, I, I have no empathy with that kind of, that kind of, view of history. And I do think that that sense of history speeding up, of apocalypticism, of a surge towards a kind of a new brutalism, a kind of decadent social sadism that I feel very much around us in the here and now, I do not think that that is merely the arrogance of history, the arrogance of despair, thinking that our own moment is somehow special and unique. History is not always the same, and we live in a particularly toxic and vile part of it. And the idea that you would look back at this incredible moment and say, well, you know, nothing to see here is almost beyond belief to me, except, as you imply, it's all too believable. I think that's uh, a perfect place to end it. China Mieville, thanks so much for talking to us. The book is October, the story of the Russian Revolution, out now. Thanks so much. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah.